Council Coxo. I concur with you, um, Mr. Chairman. I think it's a good policy move, and I would like to see it in place. And if at some time in the future we do need to make an amendment, we have that option. But as a basic policy now, it would be a very sound policy. And I think it also would not, uh, would perhaps discourage um, development of land mm -hmm. in that you're not paying a fee um, to be, to have the sewer in front of your piece of land, therefore you're not going to be forced to um, develop it or sell it off sooner. Right. Other comments regarding the motion that is before us? If not, all those of the, of the, in favor of the motion as it's before us, please raise your hands. Any opposed? So it passes six to one. Yes. I would like to add the caveat that this ordinance may affect property owners now or in the future who may or may, may or may not have been notified of this hearing. It's duly noted in the records, is that right? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, we're moving on to item number 107, which is to consider a report of the Cape Elizabeth Affordable Housing Study Committee and take any necessary action. And as has become my trademark, I have a few introductory comments that I'd like to offer before you come down to make yours. Uh, just for the, the, the citizens that are in the audience and, and as well as people that are at home, I think you should know that it's been about a year since the Town Council established the Affordable Housing Committee. The reason that we did so is because we as a, as a council feel that this is a issue that is of paramount importance to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. We all know what's happened to the cost of housing in our town, especially over the last five years. And when it gets to the point where children of people that have lived here for generations can no longer afford houses here, when it gets to the point that the overwhelming majority of, of our town workers uh, can no longer afford houses here, it's just merely symptomatic of a much more unsettling problem. So we formed this committee and asked them to look into it. To me, it all gets down to our town goals. Do we as a town place a value in diversely priced housing stock? And do we feel that as a town council, if we do place a value in it, that there's anything that we can do about it to achieve that goal? So I'd now like to ask uh, Kathleen Connor, who's the chairman of the Affordable Housing Committee, to come forward and make remarks on the excellent report that you've presented to us and that the councils have in front of them. Thank you very much, Chairman Latore. To the councillors, my name is Kathleen Connor, and I live at 22 Farm Hill Road. I am, I, I want to state at the onset, a volunteer here. I'm serving as a town resident um, on this particular committee. Um, I served on this committee starting uh, last April with uh, my fellow members who are Jane Amaro, Janet Greenlaw, Nancy Masterton, Juan Perez, George Schumann, and Brad Schwartz. Uh, our staff person was uh, Michelle Ringrose. And she had was formerly with the Council of Governments and now a, a private consultant. Um, and I thank her for her efforts because without her we would not have been able to produce this, um, this document. About a year ago, the Council of Governments on behalf of, of Cape Elizabeth and Yarmouth applied for a grant from the Maine State Housing Authority. The grant uh, of $6,000 from the state, $2,000 from Cape Elizabeth, and $2,000 from Yarmouth uh, granted for this study. The idea was to look at, at the houses in, in areas that were uh, really in the higher housing market in the state of Maine. It's a, quite a difficult issue, and I think that um, the Cape Elizabeth town is to be commended for being on the forefront of this issue because in, it had been studied at the state level, there's the affordable housing, the governor's affordable housing task force, it's been studied at the regional level, particularly in Cumberland County and York County. And finally, uh, Cape Elizabeth and uh, it, with Yarmouth really are the first two towns that I know of that have studied this on, on their own. And I think that that's really important. And I hope that that, that uh, is sort of a precedent as you look at this report and think about the strategies <coughs> that are included in it and when you're thinking about uh, possibly implementing and adopting the report. Uh, in, during our study, we, we read a lot. We saw, uh, we had different speakers come in. We took a bus tour, uh, mostly in southern Maine, but also in uh, Scarborough, uh, mostly in York County, I meant to say, uh, and then Scarborough to see some different affordable housing projects. Uh, we talked to a lot of people. We held a forum. We had, I think, about 10 or so people who spoke at that forum, uh, but hopefully the word got out to quite a few others um, during the forum because it was televised. Um, 
finally then, we took that information, thought about it, came up with this strategy that you have contained in this report. There are really 20 strategies, uh, overall strategies within that. Our overall goal, though, is to provide housing for uh, people that meet the 80% of median income for the area. Now, for the area, it's th that median income is 24000 approximately $24,000. The, the Cape Elizabeth, when I say that the area too, I mean Greater Cumberland or Greater Portland. The Cape Elizabeth median income is $34,000. This is a 1987 estimate. What's interesting is that it's greater than the MSA median, that the Greater Portland median, which is about $30,000. So, so when we're looking at it, though, I think we have to go beyond our boundaries and think of it in terms of the entire region because it's a problem that, that does transcend our boundaries. Uh, the 80% of median is used by HUD, by the state, uh, and by all the other national housing groups. So I think that it's an appropriate use of uh, the term for affordable housing. What does that buy? I mean, it's, it's only, when you look at 30% of your gross income, for that 80% for the greater Portland area, you could buy a house for $57,000. That would be 30% of your income. The rent would be about $580. If you took the Cape Elizabeth median, $34,000, that buys an $86,000 house and a rent of about $800. Finally, if you took the Cape Elizabeth median, I hadn't talked about that, but that's a lot higher, 42582 you could buy a house for $112,000. Uh, that also translates into a, a rent of about $1,000 a month. It's difficult. When you think of what is out there in that price range, the cheapest house that we could find in Cape Elizabeth for sale is around 100000 right now. For the greater area, probably 80,000 uh, for, for a detached single family house. Um, there are some condominiums now because the market is somewhat soft that it, uh, they're a little bit lower. You can get some for seventy seventy five thousand dollars which does make them a little more affordable. Um, but still, it's difficult. But as we, as we proceeded, we tried to take a range of 57,000 to about 110,000 for the area for rent, for, excuse me, for, for uh, home ownership units. Uh, as, as our target for the type of affordability um, for, for people of this area. How do you get there? We're, we're recommending, again, a 20-point strategy. It's an action plan. In that strategy, there are um, proposals for local, state, and federal changes. I'd like to highlight just some of those under the local section. Uh, talked about the comprehensive plan. I think that it's important that these recommendations be adopted as part of the comprehensive plan. And that is really the foundation for this. Without these types of recommendations in such a plan, you would not have the basis to enact other zoning, subdivision, sewer, or other policies in Cape Elizabeth. And I think it's very important that these be considered uh, as part of that plan. We have some strategies for zoning and subdivision, again, which would fall out of that comprehensive plan. They would be pursuant to that plan, and I think that they're important because right now, um, as Councillor Masterton noted, that there are many ordinances that need to be reviewed because they seem to uh, impede the development of affordable housing. Uh, land acquisition. As we heard time and again during this last year, land seems to be the key uh, to affording it. Many of the units that can be developed cost about the same amount of money, no matter where you put them. Uh, but it's the land that changes the, uh, the house from being affordable to not affordable. Uh, the town could also get into housing development or, or, or overseeing purchasing land, land acquisition. That's another area that, that the town could, could uh, proceed into in order to reduce the price of housing. Education, I think that this is key. Um, finding out that a lot of people have different ideas about what affordable housing is and how it might affect uh, property values and so forth. And I think that it's important that there be an ongoing effort to introduce people to the idea and let them know that it can, only, it can look like your house next door, the teachers in your town, towns could, could live there, 
other townspeople, people in the area, people like your neighbors. I think one of the key questions that, that we asked ourselves over and over again, could you buy your house today uh, at the price it's valued given your income today? And I think many people would not be able to do that. And I, I would hate to see that Cape Elizabeth um, would become a place of the haves and the have-nots. And, and I think that's really important. Um, and, I, and I think that that was sort of in the back of our minds as we were creating this strategy. Um, I just want to say on these local strategies um, that many of these are really new ways of looking at traditional tools used in, in planning and uh, zoning and, and for just uh, town policy, and I think that that's important. Um, state reforms. Uh, we found out we have one recommendation about uh, looking at the block grant application. Cape Elizabeth never fares very well because we're not perceived as being a needy community, and I, and I think that's true. But uh, somehow, if we could do something in order to afford uh, or to be able to build affordable housing, I think that would be important. And there may be other programs out there that could be developed uh, by which Cape Elizabeth could benefit from. Uh, finally, on the federal end, there needs to be some money for housing assistance. A lot of the old housing programs are now defunct, and they're not, uh, the tax laws are, are not always favorable toward developing this type of housing. Um, and I think that there needs to be some incentives beyond the local and state, state uh, tools that are used in order to provide this, because it seems to take uh, a variety of measures in order to implement affordable housing. Really, why is, it, why is affordable housing important? And I think, as uh, Chairman said, socioeconomic diversity, and I, and I think that's that's key. We we really do not want to uh, become a homogenous area with the same kind of people. And I think that there's more the more variety, the better. Uh, an important part that last spring, there's the new growth management legislation. Part of that legislation requires that 10 percent of all new housing. Uh, being built in communities must be affordable. Now, I believe that that standard will be the 80% of median for the you know, greater Portland area, the MSA. In Cape Elizabeth, from what I understand, it will have to be done by 1991. Uh, so I think that the timing of the comprehensive plan is really important because you'll have um, about a year in which to come up with some new ordinances that would be pursuant to that plan and also meet the state guidelines and requirements for um, the growth management. There is a growing need for affordable housing. I think that there are a lot of people who wish to live in, in this town and aren't able to, and I think that it would be nice to be able to meet that need. Um, it, it includes all sectors of the society, again, the elderly, the young, people just starting out. I hope that we can keep up the momentum and, and implement the strategies in this report if it is adopted. Um, it may take time and, and I think a considerable amount of energy to pull this together, but it's important. And I think that one thing we have to keep in mind is that um, individually these strategies may not be the answer, but I think by combining them we may be able to, to start in the right direction and provide affordable housing. Um, I was happy to read in the paper yesterday about the Jordan Trust and one of the recommendations that that group might be making tonight, if I read the paper correctly, saying that uh, it might, might be a useful uh, uh, fund for affordable housing. And I think that that's, that was nice to read. And so I'm going to end here, and I, and I thank you for, the, for taking the time to uh, listen to, to my discussion of this report. And I hope that... Um, I'm not sure exactly what action you would take, but I, I think I would urge you to incorporate these strategies into the comprehensive plan or whatever other mechanism is, is most appropriate, but that they, that they become part of Cape, Cape Elizabeth's policy and that they're used and that we will still be on the forefront in uh, providing affordable housing um, in Cape Elizabeth and one of the first in uh, the greater Portland region and in the state. Thank you, and I can answer any questions you might have. Okay, I'd like to take questions for Kathleen now. Councilor Masterton? I have a statement. Kathleen, you were a delight to work, to work with. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much for your leadership, and thank you also, Michelle Ringrose, for your very fine staff work. Thanks. Uh, other questions? Yes. Or, or, or statements, I'm sorry. I need to preempt the conversation here. <laughs> 
Well, let me just wonder out loud for a moment. I, I think this is an extraordinary document, and, and certainly my hat is off to, uh, to all of the people uh, on the committee, uh, my fellow counselors, the, the entire uh, crew that, that really hammered this document out. It's a, it's a most uh, impressive document. Um, in your conclusion, you, uh, you note that uh, for this to happen, many of the recommendations in this report must be implemented. Uh, as I go over the 20 uh, recommended uh, areas, uh, it's an extraordinary job, certainly, to include all 20. My, my thought is that the Council would be in a position this evening of accepting uh, the report, not to adopt all of the recommendations, and then we would forward this report then perhaps uh, either to the Comprehensive uh, Planning Commission or the Ordinance Committee, what procedurally would take place in order to then set up priorities with regard to the 20 recommendations? I would suggest something of this magnitude we could have a workshop on. I don't, th I don't think we should make the decision at this level, but I, it's certainly weighty and meaty mm -hmm. enough to be workshop <coughs> format to decide what to do <coughs> from mm -hmm. there. <coughs> Former Councilor Penny Carson. Just a point of information to the Council. Uh, last night the Comprehensive Planning Board met at their regular meeting time and when we got to the meeting we were presented with the affordable plan, uh, the, this committee report. We have not had a chance to look at it. It seems that to, for the Council to address the affordable committee report on one hand and the comprehensive report on the other hand separately is really going to be inappropriate and difficult, I think, for you but it would be better if the Comprehensive Planning Committee had an opportunity to also workshop this report to try and fit it into our existing report because theoretically it would have been better to have this one before we began the comprehensive plan and they were running concurrently. And so we have not, not knowing and having any idea what this plan was going to say, we have addressed the words affordable housing but we've got no strategies or anything. We were waiting for this so I really think that even before you schedule a workshop, we ought to have an opportunity to try and feed it into the comprehensive plan in some way. And then, you know, you have a, a whole document to... Councilor Amar? And you can add or eliminate anything, of course. Penny, do you think it might be appropriate for the council or some portion of the council to meet with the comprehensive plan and maybe a couple of people from the planning board to discuss it together? It probably would. We are meeting, I believe, with the council. I, I think it's next uh, Monday. Yep. But March we 20th. will not have had an opportunity to put the affordable housing plan into our comprehensive plan at all. Do you, do you envision that you will have time to do so? We because have to because have to. I don't that's, think that they can I be said. addressed separately at all. Right. Um, one must remember that we base the agenda and the layout for the comprehensive plan on the community survey, all of whom were opposed to affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So we didn't address it, but we knew that your committee was going to come forward with a report. Mm -hmm. So I just offer that as your information. We've had a not had a chance to address it at all. Penny, just a clarification. Mm -hmm. The wording of that survey did not ask about affordable housing. No, it, the wording of the survey is it was not appropriate to this title of affordable housing. But you could, but so we didn't address it right. as part of our agenda, other than just the words affordable housing. It sounds housing. like Monday night would be a good opportunity to have a discussion about this. It, it, it would to get to, for our committee to get your opinion, but we will have not met about it to feed it into any of the slots of our segments. You know, you have a 40-page document. Several areas will address this, but it's not in our report yet. I'd rather get the comprehensive plan a little bit later and have you incorporate it than bring it to us in a big hurry without the having the chance to digest a, a document as major, with the implications as major as this, so. We haven't read it at all, and we will not meet, be meeting before your Monday night meeting. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, Council Jordan. Is it all right to point out a couple of things that I don't agree with? Mm -hmm. I want to thank. I have my <laughs> I have my gavel ready though, in case I don't agree with it. No. I want I want to thank the committee and Kathleen for the presentation and all of that. But I would just, as I read it, there's a couple of things that I'll just throw out. One or two of them. And it's just a, maybe a choice of wording when they ask for a developer to set aside 10% additional <coughs> units gained for affordable housing. Now, would that, do you mean by that that would be 10% plus 
Plus, if he had the piece of land, he's got to give 10% for open space also and 10% for affordable housing and so on down the line. Is that the thinking in back? Uh, something for you to think about anyway. She mentioned land. When everybody mentions land, the price of land, it kind of, my hair's pretty straight, but it stirs up a little bit. I think the ordinances regulates the price of your land. And Cape Elizabeth ordinances put land in pretty high. In a s community that's no far, not too far away from here can put, we'll say, two units on an acre. And some of them even put four. And some of these people that can't afford to buy a house in Cape Elizabeth can go to that community and buy a house. And they'll get thirty to $50,000 for those house lots. And that puts an acre of land, if it's 50000 two, that puts them up to $100,000 an acre. And in Cape Elizabeth, they got to have two acres, which is 80,000 square feet, and they got to have 200-foot frontage unless you're in a development. So I think is what she said, and I'm glad we have a council here is thinking that audiences have got to be looked at, and they specifically with affordable housing, and I think if I can live long enough, I can be there and maybe I'll get it so somebody else could build a house without having to have a 200-foot frontage because I think it's a waste of land. And it puts up the price of the land. But if you don't own any land, it don't matter to you. But when you own a little land, you begin to think of a few of these things. And I just wanted to point out that what we really got to do and what my opinion to get affordable housing down going down the right road you got to go back and start over your ordinances and make some changes so you can afford to do it don't wait for somebody to give it to you because i don't think you'll get it all you might get a portion of it thank you counselor other questions or comments for kathleen while she is is there Councilor Amaro? yeah just just a comment uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was at a luncheon where the mayor of San Antonio spoke. And one of the things he said was that if a uh, community always waits for the federal funds or the state funds or whatever funds they hope are going to come down the road to do what they think is right for their community, they're not going to get it done because that just isn't the climate out there now. We have a huge na national deficit, as you all know. And even though I know Senator Mitchell is introducing an affordable housing bill, uh, which I think is admirable, but I know what kind of a price tag it's going to have, and, and the chances are not great. But I'm just so proud of our community that we are doing what people like uh, Henry Cisnero says communities should be doing, and that is take care of yourself and look at your own audiences and look at what you're doing. And if, if we as a council really think that this is an important issue to have affordable housing in our community, we can do it if we want to. And I, this, this report shows it. And uh, I would like to second Nancy's comments on uh, uh, working with both Michelle Ringrose, who served us very well, and Kathleen Connor as chair of this committee. I think there'll still be lots of discussion about this report. <laughs> but uh, it gives us lots to discuss, and that's important. No, I would just, I'd just like to ask a, a couple of clarification points, I guess. The growth management plan that you talk about on the statewide level, mm -hmm. when it says here in the report that municipalities will be asked to voluntarily adopt measures, is that, could you just yes. make that clear to me again? Is it voluntary or is it something that's going to become law and we must okay. adopt? Um, the comprehensive plan that you submit must have an affordable housing component in it. You, it is your option to have the state approve your comprehensive plan and review it. So that's where the option comes in. However, if you choose not to submit your comprehensive plan and have it I guess endorsed by the by the state, you will not be eligible for state funds. So waterfront action grants, CZM money, uh, other state grants will be lost, um, and there may be other other carrots that they will hold out there that we will not be eligible for. So in a sense, it is voluntary uh, as part of that plan, but it's really a, a requirement. Mm -hmm. And one other very interesting suggestion is number three, and I just wanted to clarify, which is to create a community land trust and establish a management authority for affordable housing. Are you thinking along the lines of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust that they would have as another responsibility uh, affordable housing? Because here we, 
I'm not quite sure, but here we might have a very interesting dilemma in terms of they want to buy up land for open space, and you might want them to buy up land for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Is it? I just wonder if it's two locomotives on the same track waiting to hit, and, and we're all going to be interested to see where the policy decisions come down. But I, I would back that up by saying also that the comprehensive plan and its survey shows time and again by far the number one issue of the citizens is preservation of open space, land use management, maintaining our rural residential character. So I'm, I'm intrigued to see how this is going to play out over the next couple of years because as policymakers we're going to have to put up or shut up one way or another. And, uh, yeah. I think that uh, on their face they, they do look like incongruous, um, but they, if there's a piece of land that does have wetlands or other uh, valuable parts that need to be preserved, there may be parts of that that could be developed and that's where the use of uh, cluster zoning or cluster housing and uh, other tools like that come in so that they can work together and you may get some income off a part of that property to enable you to purchase that other part and so and uh, the thing is the state law does allow land trusts to have the uh, both uh, both charges to to be a land bank and also to have have uh, do affordable housing and it has been used in other states mm -hmm. apparently not in Maine yet but um, I think that they can work together but I think that you have to be very careful so that you are preserving the, the land that needs to be preserved and then developing yeah. that if possible and by using th some things that may not have been used in this town before. I think it's interesting as we as, as policymakers are, are I'm, I'm asked constantly about can we have the, all the open space that we want and still have this affordable housing if it's the will of the community. And I think your report begins to chart out the compromise course that's going to have to develop mm -hmm. if, if we really truly in our hearts want both. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I really do also compliment you highly on the kind of compromise tone. I guess politics is the art of compromise and you've, you've <laughs> begun to kind of chart out a way for us where in fact it might be possible. One other thing I do want to end the line is I hope that we can make these permanently affordable. That's one thing I'm certainly going to be watching. I don't want anybody to make a windfall profit on this thing down the line because they've held on to it for two years, three years. I've seen developments in other towns where people are now multi, multi millionaires because they were affordable housing for five years and that's mm -hmm. not at all what, I, what I'm going to endorse and I think I feel that theme running through your yes. report as well. And, and I think that the committee did feel that way. Throughout. Yeah. So congratulations to all that served on this committee. Outstanding. Thank you very much. I would, I would just like to add one more thing to, and it goes along with what uh, Councilor Amaral just said. I just got back last night from the National League of Cities and the main delegation met with the Senator Mitchell and Cohen, Representative Brennan and Snow McCurran, I guess you use Snow maybe to be official. And uh, they said the same thing, that uh, don't expect no great things coming out of Washington. And, uh, and Mitchell also did say that he was introducing a bill for affordable housing, but he says, I'll do what I can with it, but don't look for any great things, especially the first year. So we should start down the road on our own, and maybe they'll come along and help us on the end. Yes. The chairman, as one of the uh, counselors not on the committee, I'd like to move uh, acceptance of the report. Okay, do we move it to acknowledge receipt of the report or acceptance of the report? How about receipt. Acknowledge, acknowledge receipt. receipt of the report? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. <laughs> All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. What I'd like to do is right now poll my fellow counselors. At some point it would be appropriate to take a break. I, I would prefer that we had the Thomas Jordan Trust Study Committee come forward next and then at that juncture take a break. Would that be, be acceptable? Good. They look weary out there. Look we good. have a, an exciting film which will be shown, by the way, on Channel 38 during the break. 12 minutes about the Main Street 90. So you, none of you will even be able to go to your refrigerators and get another glass of milk or cookies because you'll be glued to your television sets. <laughs> okay, we would now go to item 108, which is to consider the report of the Thomas Jordan Trust Study Committee and take any necessary action. I just wanted to give a few brief comments by saying to those in the audience here and also those at home, the Thomas Jordan Study Committee was established in August 1988 by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council to do three things which I'm just going to rough out very briefly. To review the property bequeathed to the town by Thomas Jordan under his will of 1825. To study our town obligations as trustees for such property. 
and trustees for the poor of Cape Elizabeth of these properties, and also to recommend to the town council uses for said properties for the benefit of the poor of the town. So at this juncture, I'd like to introduce David Wakelin, who is the chair of this committee, to come forward and uh, make appropriate comments regarding this excellent report. I have a color copy of this. Of the map, and I don't know if we can put it up on here or not. Let me see. Uh, good, but better than nothing. And that is simply a copy of the. Uh, a slightly larger copy of the map that was in the report. Um, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the council, I'm David Wakelin. I live at uh, 10 Forest Road in Cape Elizabeth. And I was asked uh, last summer to uh, chair the committee to study the Thomas Jordan uh, Trust and to look into the, the number of things that the chairman just spoke about. Uh, it was an excellent committee. We had a, a, a very enjoyable time working together. Um, the members of the committee were uh, Reverend Walter Brown, uh, Penny Carson, Phyllis Cogsall, uh, Paula House, John Lescure, Suzanne Terrian, and myself. Uh, we met, gee, I don't know exactly, but I think it was something in the vicinity of eight times, had a lot of discussions and reports uh, in the interim, uh, and worked very closely with the uh, town attorney uh, on a number of uh, very technical legal issues as they relate to the identification of exactly what property uh, was in the trust and exactly what the obligations of the town might be with regard to this property. Um, I think one of the issues which we dealt with very early in the report is very key in terms of our overall finding. Uh, and that is that in fact in the will of Thomas Jordan in 1825 that the property was left in trust to the town uh, for the poor of the town and not to the town directly. The specific language of the will was that whatever portion of my estate shall remain undisposed of at the death of my, w my said wife or on her ceasing to be a widow shall belong to the town of Cape Elizabeth aforesaid in fee and in trust for the poor of said town forever. Um, with the benefit of the advice of the town attorney, we reviewed that issue uh, very closely. Uh, and the reason that that's very key is that clearly the duties and responsibilities of the town in holding property in fee without any trust obligation is very different than holding the, la the uh, property as a fiduciary for the benefit of some group of beneficiaries. Uh, the recommendation from the town attorney was that the language in the will created a trust relationship. Uh, at that point, the question, the, one of the questions to deal with, with was, who is the trustee? Uh, the, obviously, the language in the will was uh, not particularly uh, precise, uh, but our, our concept is that the town of Cape Elizabeth is the trustee acting by and through its governing body being the town council. Uh, that responsibility may or may not be uh, delegated by the town council at some point in the future, but as of this point, no specific action has been taken by the town to, uh, to transfer or delegate uh, that authority. So that the, uh, the committee determined that, one, that a trust relationship exists, and two, that the trustee was the town acting through the town council. Um, we also reviewed uh, quite a bit of the property that's on this map, uh, and um, not only did we walk the property, but review specific deeds and issues with the uh, town attorney. Uh, and while we have a good outline as to the approximate uh, boundaries of the property, for two specific reasons, it is very difficult to uh, know the exact boundaries. And those reasons are, one, that the uh, property was transferred to Mr. Jordan primarily by um, devise uh, and not by specific purchase of the property and therefore we don't have deeds in because it went through the probate process one and two because the probate records uh, were all destroyed in 1866 and therefore we have summaries of a number of those documents but unfortunately not all of the documents that we'd like to have 
Uh, therefore, the town attorney has said that he can give us a reasonable guesstimate as to the exact boundaries, but a good bit of work will be required in order to determine the exact boundaries. Uh, in light of the fact that uh, the cost and the time involved with that process would be fairly significant, all the committee has done is to say, this is what we understand to be the approximate boundaries of the property, uh, and we would recommend that additional work be done in the future to determine the exact boundaries. We have contacted through the town attorney um, a number of the abutting landowners and have had uh, uh, some discussions with them, but the exact boundaries, of course, have not been worked out as we indicated. Uh, we haven't gotten a specific uh, estimate as to the cost, but it has uh, been uh, estimated by the town attorney as being quite significant. So that's something that we have recommended be pursued in the future, but that it could not be completed within this time frame, nor within uh, any kind of reasonable budget uh, considerations that we had currently. Um, so we have a good idea what the property is, but we do not know exact, the exact boundaries of the property. Having then determined that a trust relationship exists, the next question to look at is, who are the beneficiaries of the trust? Uh, the language in the will was that the beneficiaries were the poor of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, obviously, uh, you all know probably better than myself that at that point the town of Cape Elizabeth and the city of South Portland were uh, combined entities, so we had to deal with the whole question of uh, in defining the poor of Cape Elizabeth. Did that include folks who currently live in the, in the uh, city of South Portland currently or residents or future residents of the town of Cape Elizabeth? Uh, the, again, the town attorney was able to help us with this. Uh, there was a detachment statute that was passed in 1895, uh, spelled out in the report, uh, that indicates that in essence the, uh, those, uh, the, the paupers of the various communities would be allocated to the town of Cape Elizabeth and the city of South Portland uh, based upon their, their last residence. And therefore, uh, the uh, town attorney was able to give us an opinion that the beneficiaries, were we to focus on the poor, that we would be focusing on the poor of the current town of Cape Elizabeth in which this property uh, uh, resides uh, as compared to the city of South Portland. Uh, and so that in identifying who the poor are, the first question is what are the geographical limits and the committee recommends that the advice of the town, count, uh, of the town attorney be um, adopted which is that the poor would be within the geographical boundaries of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, with regard to what individuals should be classified, uh, we did not focus upon a specific bright line test, but rather recommended that in a longer term plan of a, a trust management program, which would have to be uh, approved, and I'll discuss that in a second, that there be two aspects of the determination. One would be to adopt some objective standards, being the federal poverty guidelines uh, or a, a comparable uh, uh, poverty definitions within the state. But in addition to that, to adopt a relative standard within the community, which may or may not uh, reflect either, it, it presumably would reflect more than the, the strictly the federal poverty guidelines by, by picking a particular percentage uh, of the community, either by household incomes or individual incomes, per capita income. There are a number of ways in which that could be done. But the key here is that as part of the trust management plan, that we would have two aspects. One would be an objective standard, and the other be a relative standard within the community. Uh, having done that, we simply made a, uh, a somewhat of a guesstimate as to, uh, or at least an example of the kind of a standard that might be used, something along the lines of the 20% uh, uh, of the household incomes. There are obviously a number of different ways to determine this, and I think to some extent that, that as part of uh, preparing a, a broader management plan, <coughs> we would want to add some specificity to that issue. Uh, so that relates to the, to the issue of who is the poor. Uh, we know the geographical limits, uh, and we have made some recommendations with regard to standards to be used to uh, determine uh, how to uh, f define the poor in the future. Um, the next issue relates to uh, the fiduciary duty that the town has with regard to this property. Um, through, si through the period in which the poor farm was maintained and utilized, presumably the property was being used for the benefit of the poor. Uh, since that time, 
since the uh, poor farm ceased being uh, ceased operations and it was destroyed, uh, as a practical matter, the property has been used for the benefit of all citizens of the community and not simply the poor. Uh, this is particularly true with regard to the siting of the uh, transfer station as well as the location of uh, several leased properties to the Portland Water District. Uh, the committee believes that the town council should take positive steps to uh, begin to fulfill its fiduciary duty with regard to this property and that the property not continue to lay fallow or continue to be utilized uh, primarily for all the citizens as compared to the beneficiaries of this trust. Clearly the, the beneficiaries of the trust are the poor of the town and while they benefit peripherally from the use in another manner, uh, they do not benefit primarily from that. Uh, and uh, there were a number of specific uses with regard to the property that we looked at in that regard uh, and felt that, again, they were getting some uh, secondary benefit but not any primary benefit from that. Now, in terms of the property as a whole, uh, maybe I'll turn this around a little bit. In the, in the view of the committee, there are really three separate parts of this um, uh, land. One is the wetlands, which is marked off in, in red and colored uh, um, markings here. The other is the, the second part of it is the transfer station and the third part of it is property which is uh, possibly developable. So that there really are three separate parts of it. One is the wetlands, one is the transfer station, and the third part uh, differentiating is uh, possible upland or, or dry developable property. Um, the Clearly with regard to the transfer station, uh, that has been used for the benefit of all citizens and as we'll get into the discussion of our recommendations with regard to possible utilization of that, um, the committee's feeling was that again while that had been used for the benefit of all citizens, the poor should not be made to carry the burden for the rest of the community as it relates to the diminution in value of that portion of the property. Uh, at this point, there are uh, obviously uh, constraints with regard to the uh, environmental use of that uh, property, whether in fact it could be uh, returned to its prior condition remains to be seen. Uh, but at this point, uh, whether one, whether it could be returned or cleansed, or two, whether it could be used for any other purpose uh, than a transfer station or open space remains to be seen. Uh, with regard to the other property, uh, which had been the subject of a possible um, uh, conservation easement uh, sale to the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service. Again, the committee felt that this may have, may be a very good thing to do and, and many members of the committee were very concerned and interested in the environmental aspects, uh, but the, the question that was raised again was, is this a, a diminution in value or a benefit primarily for the poor or for all of the citizens of the town. Uh, if you focus on the fact that this property is held in trust for the uh, benefit of the poor, the question is whether in terms of putting a conservation easement on the property, which may be absolutely the best thing to do for the, the total citizenry of the town, should in fact the poor who are the beneficiaries of this property bear the principal burden for that. And I think that the answer that the committee came up with is no, they should not that in fact all the citizens of the community should be involved in that process. Um, so that with regard to both the assets and the possible disposition of the, uh, of the uh, uh, property, the, our recommendation is that the town consider purchasing the property. At that point, uh, it could uh, then decide what it wanted to do with regard to the uh, wetlands property in terms of, a, of an easement. With regard to the upland property, we have a number of recommendations that possibly that be used for affordable housing or that it be kept for open space uh, or possibly for a cemetery use or other uses and that the transfer station be used for uh, transfer station purposes. Um, we recognize that um, uh, this may not have been um, the anticipation either of the council or the citizens in terms of this report. Uh, on the other hand, having determined that a trust relationship exists, uh, the committee felt that it was uh, obligated to suggest to the town uh, what it thought the town's obligations or the town council's obligations 
ought to be in regard to Philip fulfilling its fiduciary duties. Um, having said that, I might open it to uh, questions for the council or others. Thank you for that outstanding report. Very, very, very clear and concise. And uh, I would like to now open it to questions and <coughs> comments. Councilor Masterton. David, this is the most interesting report I've read in a long time, really. Congratulations on it. Thanks. Could you point out on your map where the suggested easement to the Rachel Carson uh, refuge? I believe, and I don't know if you have be, your copy you know of, the, of the report. Yes, absolutely. The, in essence, on the copy that you have and on here, it is indeed the, the, the shaded property that goes right along the uh, right along the river. Do you have your copy there? It would it would start over here, which is toward the, the high school is down here, uh, Scott Dyer Road here, and the Spurwink Road going through the middle. That it is the shaded property here that is, that is uh, that would be the subject of the easement. Not and the I, striped, not the striped. Well, I think it is the striped, possibly the striped on yours. Yes, what comes off is the shaded. The uh, uh, on yours, the, the white property uh, that is not, uh, that is not have, does, except for where the dump is, is um, property that would not be subject to uh, that easement. Thanks. Councilor Joy? Yes. Has this map been changed? Why is Michael gone? Has this map been changed since we dealt with the you and fish and wildlife people? As far as. Uh, I didn't realize we crossed Burnick Avenue when we was discussing it with them. And this map shows that they've crossed Burnick Avenue and gone up in back of the high school. And I didn't realize that was going with the... Well, okay. that's... Okay. I, I understood that's what he just said. You're right, sir. I, I am reading that incorrectly. This is uh, resource protection uh, okay. district over here. And indeed, the, the easement stops at uh, Spurwink Avenue. I apologize. Okay. Now... When you followed the line from Spurn Avenue down towards the marsh, did anybody walk that line, or is that is that uh, how's that come about? Uh, the line along the river? No, from Spurn Avenue mm -hmm. going towards the river. That's a straight line down across there, right? Then you go over and back at Cheese. We w we walked in the in that area, but we didn't specifically walk the boundary. No. Okay, but that's an estimate of where it is. Yes, is yes, that correct? yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> acreage is what bothers me, and evidently when they say 150 acres there, that means that uh, that's a whole marsh. Is that correctly, Michael? I, again, I presume so. This, is, this was provided to us by uh, the town attorney who had a, uh, uh, an individual in his office, and we reviewed it with uh, the town manager. But the, as to, I think that the um, specific acreages on either side were estimates. Were estimates? Yes. Okay. The Rachel Carson, well, this is more, I'll forget, I'll withdraw. It's no need of him getting into that because that's something else again. Okay. Other comments and questions for David? I, I would, oh, yes, go ahead. Councilor Green. Dave, I've got a question on doing the research necessary to establish the exact boundaries. What kind of research are we talking about for that? Well, if I understood correctly, and there's some materials that there were exhibits uh, to the um, to the report uh, from the town attorney, uh, they would have to spend additional time, presumably in probate records, uh, uh, possibly um, going to each of the abutters and trying to get get copies of each one of their leases and and trying to piece it all together. Uh, it is primarily, as I understand it, uh, the, to some extent, the edges of some of the property, not, not whether there is title to the, to the piece in the middle. Uh, and I suppose that, that um, you know, the exact acreage of the property could be worked out more specifically. But if I understood correctly, the problem relates to the exact boundaries <coughs> of, of whether, in fact, it is a, indeed a straight line or whether, in fact, in a number of these places, uh, there might be a more uh, uh, exact line that could be worked out. And even, it, it, the uh, town attorney simply suggested that, that uh, this would in involve quite a lot of work uh, and considerably more than straight title work in terms of going to, the, going to the registry of deeds and working out that. Did you get the impression that the exact boundaries could be established with this kind of effort? 
um, they could be more exact than what was presented to us, uh, the impression that we got, as to whether the, the full and exact boundaries could ever be completely determined, uh, it was not clear. Okay, that's one of my concerns as a policy issue is if we do approve more monies to establish these boundaries, when is it good enough mm -hmm. for all parties concerned? That's something that I think we're going to have to ponder. Mm -hmm. I, I want to just ask kind of some broad questions. One, do you think that past councils realize their fiduciary duty as, le as trustees for the poor of this land? In other words, I'm thinking about past council policy going way back where I guess the, uh, uh, poor farm was established there, which was, which was some council's way of dealing with helping the poor by saying, you know, in, in the traditional old days when there was a poor farm. Do you know anything about the history of the poor farm there or just what I've read from a number of sources, uh, newspaper accounts and things along those lines. So that I, I don't know, for example, uh, exactly you know, when it was established and what in, how the property was used prior to that time for the benefit of the poor. Mm -hmm. I know that it has been farmed at different times. Uh, it has been leased out for haying. Uh, there have been a number of, of different uses of the property. Mm -hmm. um, in direct response to your question, however, uh, clearly not having been here to uh, uh, to discuss this, I would question whether, in fact, uh, uh, the fiduciary duty of the town council had been fully delineated in the past. Uh, my own estimation is that probably it was not. Uh, our feeling from looking at the way the property has been used um, was that it has been treated in, in many senses just as would other town property on the basis of the fact that it's free and clear of trust and available for any reasonable town purpose. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that they have uh, uh, not fulfilled their fiduciary duty because obviously the property has increased significantly in value. I think, however, that, that um, if this council or a council in the relatively near future does not deal with this, I think that there could be some problems down the road. Uh, clearly with regard to the use of the transfer station, if on, on whatever definition you use of poor, uh, the, uh, they are getting a proportional use of that property, but only presumably a minority uh, benefit. Uh, the, we did consider a number of other alternatives with regard to the use of the property, which were incorporated in some senses into our recommendations of use of the money. Uh, but the, it, there are a number of obviously competing interests in terms of preservation of property, in terms of open space in terms of use of the property as a transfer station, uh, that it seemed preferable under those circumstances to have the town and its citizens consider purchasing the property outright to full, then use the money to fulfill its duty. At that point, the town would be, in a sense, released uh, with regard to that specific property. And those funds could then be utilized for any number of different purposes a as the needs would develop um, along the way. Um, I think that I can speak for the committee in saying that simply letting the land lie fallow uh, for whomever it may benefit, we did not consider that to be a, a reasonable exercise of fiduciary duty. And while there is no specific time frame on, on the uh, uh, rectification of that problem, we do think that this council or a council relatively near future should give that some attention. There's so many interesting issues here, and I don't want to overly dominate, but one if you looked at it, what better, what better way could a trustee invest money right now than land in Cape Elizabeth? As Will Rogers said, they ain't making any more. It's, it's certainly probably, in terms of a portfolio, one of the best investments you could possibly have. So in some ways, saying that w where the money is invested right now, in terms of its growth to help the poor at some point, there could probably be no better investment. And yet, I understand what you're saying in terms of that's great, but it always keeps helping people that are out there somewhere instead of actually helping people that are here now, but that's, that's something that can be looked at as well as our other legal and moral obligations once we were elected and sworn in to the, the entire citizenry. And here's where this conflict is coming in or, or could potentially come in. We were elected to serve the entire citizenry and if this fiduciary duty puts us in direct uh, competition with that, with those duties, we have, we have some moral wrestling to do here as a council, I think, and, and hopefully we can work out some compromises. But are you, uh, is your committee recommending buy, us buying all the land? Is that the bottom line recommendation? That's the bottom line, yes. 1.8 million? one piece. Well, the, uh, we tried to make it absolutely clear that it was an extraordinarily rough guesstimate based on 
you know, without, without having gone out and tried to determine comparables, et cetera. Uh, it, it gives, however, a, a range. I mean, who knows? It may be a million dollars. It may be 2.5 million. Uh, we don't really know the exact, we're simply trying to use some information that was provided to us. Um, one of the difficulties, of course, relates to how to value the transfer station in its current condition. Uh, currently, no developer in his or her right mind would purchase that property uh, because there are uh, basically unlimited environmental risks in this state at this point, uh, and there are on that location. Uh, the question is, again, uh, you know, without being too direct, uh, the question is should the poor bear that diminution in value or should it be borne by all of those who are involved with the, uh, who past, present and future citizens of the town and our committee felt that it is more appropriate to have that borne by all the citizens rather than simply the poor. That bypasses the whole question, in all honesty, of whether in fact the past councils breached their fiduciary duty by despoiling trust property that didn't belong to them. Uh, if you, if you are get around that issue, then you don't have that problem. Uh, and so in a number of areas here, uh, specifically in the area of whether to put a conservation easement on the property uh, and what the real value of the transfer station would be if a transfer station had never been there, um, you are avoiding that entire problem by simply having the property purchased by the community and then have the community decide what areas that it wants to uh, preserve for whatever purpose, whether in fact they want to have affordable housing there, or cemetery use, or any number of other uses. Uh, and because it is, you're right that there is a direct conflict in your capacity as a steward of the interests of the citizenry and in your capacity as trustees of this trust. And in a sense, that's one of the reasons why we recommended that a trust management committee be set up so that you could have some group that, that would be involved with the long-term management of this property and hopefully recommend to you what your, your duties might be. I didn't cite that specifically, but I, I do think that I might just bring up the fact that the involvement of the probate court and the attorney general's office is key in this process, uh, primarily because uh, it, for you to sell it in your capacity as trustees to yourselves in your capacity as, uh, as uh, town uh, councilors uh, would appear on the surface and would indeed be a conflict of interest. However, if that were submitted in advance along with a management plan to the probate court, appropriate notice given to the attorney general's office and for them to participate in that process, then in fact that whole situation can be cleansed and the transaction could in fact be, be uh, appropriately carried out. Otherwise, I think that uh, we're simply looking for other additional problems uh, focusing on that down the road. And that's why we recommended that the committee be set up and a management plan be established uh, and then presented to and approved by the probate court. Mm -hmm. Councilor Creelman. Uh, I, I applaud this report. It's, uh, again, most extraordinary, uh, a tremendous job. Um, just correct my thinking here. Uh, it, it seems to me that what you're basically recommending is that um, we go about solving exactly what the boundaries are of the, of the property. This is going exactly. to be uh, an expensive task. Once that uh, expense would be paid, then, then the town would be uh, basically in a position of purchasing the entire sort of three-part parcel, roughly for a ballpark figure of $2 million. Is that I think that's essentially accurate. Now, as to whether the town, if the town is going to buy it, uh, and, and with some reasonable assurance from the town attorney that, that there will not be title attacks on the principal property, the question of how much money to spend in determining what the fringes of that property are is something that you could weigh. I think, as uh, Councillor Greenlaw suggested, uh, I I the, it's a cost-benefit analysis as to whether you want to spend X number of dollars to determine whether the line is a foot in this direction or a foot in that direction remains to be seen. But that's something that presumably the town attorney could give us additional light on it if you decided to proceed with that plan. Well, to, to continue my, my reasoning here, um, you're also recommending that a comprehensive trust management program really be prepared, both. Uh, a, a legal document as well as a, a somewhat of a permanent committee uh, to manage uh, this area and perhaps to 
um, you know, to give out appropriate funds uh, in, in regular fashion to the quote unquote poor. My, my bottom line is that this is going to be an extraordinary expense and it's an expense in the context of having put the uh, United States government on hold from the point of view of a conservation easement that we spoke about several months ago here for a relatively a small amount of money, given the uh, larger ballpark we're uh, dealing with. Um, and perhaps this ought to be directed to the town attorney, but are we in any position to um, decide in, in the context of this whole business with regard to the conservation easement, which is at least half of the property, would you say? or? Um, well, in terms of acreage, I think it is more than half, but in mm -hmm. terms of value, it's considerably less than half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, since, in fact, most of that property is wetland, uh, the highest and best use is probably not uh, development, at least under current zoning provisions. Uh, but, uh, and I, I don't mean to speak for the town attorney, even though we have talked to him about this issue. Uh, my only thought is, and I can understand the fact that, that you had made considerable progress before you ever established our committee. and. Uh, and we're creating uh, some delays and, and uh, inconvenience along the way. But simply from the fact that the price being paid by inland fisheries and game is so low uh, and that restrictions are being put on that property for whose benefit, one would question, uh, I, I would not, were I in your shoes, not be in any major hurry to complete that transaction until my uh, fiduciary responsibilities as steward of that land was, was specified or a little more clearly. Because while it may be in the best interests of the citizenry, and I b indeed believe it is personally in the best interests of all of the citizens to have that property preserved, and probably the way you are proceeding is 100% appropriate, uh, were I a trustee of that property charged with an obligation of, uh, of making that property productive and coming up with the highest and best use, um, I would question whether having the beneficiaries of that trust shoulder that burden is appropriate as compared to the citizens. Yeah, maybe a, a very simple question. Michael, and perhaps you can answer this. Um, this my, my sense is this report will not please the federal government. Is that accurate from the point of view of holding up anything with regard to this conservation easement? I, I'm just wondering what, what we ought to be doing in this regard because certainly what's being proposed to me is a lengthy process to really figure this out. Far be it uh, for me to speak for the federal government. Uh, no, I, I, I think you're right, Counselor. Uh, you know, they're not going to be pleased. It, it will be more delay. Uh, you know, I, I think in one respect, you know, they might be pleased because it, it though, because it does say that uh, the conservation restrictions that you placed on it, uh, you know, it does confirm that they've reduced the value of it. And, you know, it, it opens a possibility, and I'm not encouraging you to do this, but it opens a possibility you may want to relook at that issue and give it to them uh, for their full management without the restrictions, and so it's therefore a less cost to the town. You, you know, I'm, I'm not, again, not suggesting you want to do that. But the other, the other point, and I think the major one, is, is the one of delay, uh, because, you know, what this report is, is in essence saying that you ought not to do anything until you, you, you hear from, uh, a court of competent jurisdiction that you can do something, and uh, that's probably going to take, uh, if you know, from if you work right away on this committee report, at the very least it would be six months before you'd even be ready to approach the court. So you and, and then you it goes to that and how long that process takes. I, I don't think that process would be extraordinarily long. It would the particularly if you got the attorney general's office involved from the beginning, you, rather than waiting to notify them when you walked into the courthouse you start involving them at this point and trying to, to develop a certain dialogue, then in fact you, you might be able to walk into a court with their approval. Uh, and under those circumstances, uh, the delays of having something approved in the probate court, as I understand it, would not be uh, as long as uh, some of our other courts. Uh, and yet, an, an estimation of, of six to nine months is, is uh, a minimum, I would think. I, I just want to respond, Wayne, a little one thing to one thing that you said which is whether whether or not to use the word please or displease the federal government the only thing i can say is 
a reality of this situation is that we've come across some legal complications, which could in fact jeopardize the solid legal ground of any agreement that we would enter into with the federal government. I think any reasonable person would say, if I'm going to enter into a, a, an agreement with you, I want to make sure that where you're standing is on solid ground so that someone doesn't come back and look at the agreement five years later and say there's a problem with it. So by the fact that we've come up with it, yes, it's most unfortunate, but I don't really think it's, it's please or displeased. I think they should be, if anything, happy that we will be on much more solid legal ground with whatever we decide to do. This isn't saying that we're going to kill the idea, even as trustees. We don't know what we're going to decide. But to have it on more solid legal footing, I, I would think, is, is to their benefit in the long run. I, I hear that. I just wonder if this uh, report in any way um, influences legally um, the option of the federal government to simply condemn the land and take it by eminent domain, which is what has been uh, suggested. Uh, that's a legal question that I don't know the answer to. It, I don't know. If I don't either, but I hope it doesn't trigger that. That would most displease counselors and citizens mm -hmm. alike. I would think that they would want to deal with us fairly and know that we are trying to do everything correctly. Mm -hmm. And I think we um, should um, proceed as, as expeditiously as possible with this report and, as Mr. Wakeman suggested, um, perhaps start a dialogue between our town attorney and the attorney general. So if the council believes the correct, uh, they want to proceed this way, and it's been strongly recommended by not only our attorney, but the whole committee, that we should resolve this problem. Councilor mm -hmm. Amaral. Yeah, I I'm not sure that we as a council knew what we were creating when we created this committee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> went way beyond our expectations. But uh, given the fine committee. I take that as a compliment. <laughs> Absolutely. In other words, we're not going to shoot you. You're only the messenger. It's not your fault. I think the appointments committee are all sitting here smiling, thinking, <clears throat> my goodness, uh, what do we create? But I think we created an excellent committee that came in once again with a report that it's just, to me, unbelievable what uh, uh, people in our community are putting together on a volunteer basis and the time that they're putting in and the thoughtfulness that went into this. And uh, I agree with Phyllis. I think we should move ahead on this. I'd like to move acceptance of the report uh, of the uh, Thomas Jordan Trust Study Committee. And uh, with that ex uh, acknowledgement of, that, of the acceptance of the report, that we direct the town manager to begin working with the town attorney uh, to come up with a plan for action to be Second. presented to the Attorney General. Second. Second. Been so moved and seconded. Uh, is there any other further comments, Council Jordan? I'd, li I'd just like to make a couple of comments before you move the question and shut the conversation off. I'd like to have one shot at it. As Councilor Greenlaw, I think I could walk you two of those lines by following the stone wall, but I know an engineer wouldn't agree with it as far as surveying it, because they'd have to go it on their own. And number two, what the people done in years past, I don't know if they done too much of anything, because I can remember when they moved the Ridgeway, the highway garage used to be out here, and they moved the Ridgeway Schoolhouse from Sawyer Road over and set it up on there, and about that same time, a little before, the dump was started. and. Uh, if somebody wanted to take some time and get back in some town reports back in the late 20s, early 30s, they might find out whether there was a vote to do it or they just done it, because that was about the time that it was done. And then when the first treatment plant was built there, I know that we got an opinion from an attorney that it was legal for us to put it there, so I don't know how much research he done to do it, but. Uh, that was the one before this last one that was on the other side of the Spunk River because I was on the committee that, to build the plant. And so maybe it was a choice of, hey, we own the land, but still there's a trust. And those Jordans in the old days, they create a lot of hardships for a lot of people. So I think you did a tremendous job here. And uh, I don't agree with the lines by the way I look at this map, but. Uh, Maybe they'll come out pretty close to my imagination and what I have been told in the past of where the lines were. Thank you. Okay. Once again, we want to express our appreciation to you as chair and also to all members of the committee that put in many, many hours on this. All right. Thank you.
Any further discussion? If not, I would ask for a uh, vote on the motion that has been made regarding acknowledging receipt of the report and having our town attorney move ahead with the attorney general. All those in favor? Any opposed? Passes unanimously 7 to 0. At this time, we're going to take a 12-minute break, and I would like to mention that we're going to take item 117, proposed solid waste resolution, out of order if it be the will of our, my fellow counselors, because there's someone here sitting in the audience that's going to be making a report on that. So enjoy the uh, show about those of you at home about Maine Celebration 90. I know I'll be running back to the monitor in the back to watch it myself. People who are interested. And people that are interested after watching this, by the way, please call Town Hall tomorrow. Uh, if you wish to volunteer for the committee for our local representation in this uh, statewide project. So we'll be back in exactly 12 minutes. Thank you. What's the Recess. I'm not sure. I think I can't explain this conversation. I can't explain it. No. What the process oh. of